Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for the SAMP q and session for the Manufacturing Technology Track. And, th and again, thank you all for joining. Uh, please be aware that uh, we are recording this session and it will be posted on the SAMP -E website for viewing uh, on demand uh, for, for, uh, at a later time. Uh, if you have questions during the duration of this session, please feel free to type them into the Q&A panel uh, on, the, on the Zoom uh, taskbar on the side, and we will uh, do our best to get them answered uh, in the session. And if we can't get them answered in the session, uh, we'll make sure to get you an answer from the authors um, at a later time. So again, thank you for uh, joining us today. My name is Eric Schmid. I'm a product development engineer at Raven Industries in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I'm also a composite PhD student at the South Dakota School of Mines. Uh, today we have seven panelists joining us for the manufacturing technology session. I'm going to quickly introduce them and then we will jump into uh, what their work is, uh, uh, is on in manufacturing technology and give them a chance to answer some of the questions uh, that have been uh, already asked about their work. So our first panelist today is Genevieve Pilardi. Uh, Genevieve is a uh, student at uh, or she completed a BS in physics at uh, SUNY Genesio in upstate New York in 2018. I'm sorry, I She's think that's been, the wrong way. Uh, also studying uh, for her PhD at LSU. The title of her work is Ultrasonic Consolidation of Dry Carbon Fiber and Polyphenylene Sulfide Film. Also with us today is Scott Blake from Aligned Vision. Uh, Scott's the founder and president of Aligned Vision uh, in uh, Chelmsford, Massachusetts. They produce 3D laser uh, projection to guide hand layup in composite materials. Uh, Blake's talk today is on a holistic approach to composites quality using artificial intelligence enabled automatic inspection. Caitlin Duffner from University of British Columbia is a master's student uh, and is focusing on pre-gelation behavior of pre-preg materials. Uh, the title of her, of her work is The Effect of Material Variability on the Pre-gelation Behavior of Pre-preg Composites. Dan Ersenbach is with Collins Aerospace. Uh, Dan was at United Technologies for 17 years. Uh, working with composites uh, development manufacturing efforts. He currently manages the thermoplastic composite and metals group at Collins Aerospace. Uh, Dan's work uh, that we'll be talking about today is in situ consolidation of complex curvature thermoplastic composite parts manufactured by automated fiber placement. Chris Coyne joins us today from Comprise Tech, and he's also joined by one of his co-authors, Simon Kaiser. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to them and let them introduce themselves quickly uh, before they talk about their work tailoring epoxy foam properties with an innovative process approach using CO2 as the blowing agent. Um, Simon, you can start. Let, let's start with yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is Simon Kaiser. I'm uh, head of material development at Compress Tech here in Hamburg, in Germany. And uh, I studied mechanical engineering with a focus on composite and polymer materials at the Technical University of Hamburg. And after a short period working there at the university, I switched to Compress Tech for the R&D department. And I'm now six years in the company and mainly I work on managing the R&D project in the field of uh, tailoring composite foam uh, materials or 3D printing materials as well. Okay, my name is Chris, Chris Coyne. I did found Compress Tech years ago. Uh, before I was in university, I also made my PhD there at Carl Schulte. I uh, was in industry. And then uh, I started Compress as a startup. We had a, a big exit some, after some years. And then five years ago, I thought, what to do now? Now we have uh, 25 people, uh, specialists in composites and polymers, do a lot of very interesting uh, projects, not only in composites, also in foams, in situ protrusion, SMC stuff. Our clients are Daimler, 
BMW, Lufthansa, and so on. And I'm also quite active in SAMPI. And till last June, I was president in Europe. Thanks, guys. Also joining us today is Hossein Geyer of Concordia University. Uh, Hossein's a research assistant and is studying at the Concordia Center for Composites, investigating the effect of automated fiber placement manufacturing defects on the mechanical performance of laminated composites. Uh, his talk today is entitled Effective Gaps on the Damage Initiation and Failure of Thin Composite Laminates Manufactured by AFP Under Out-of-Plane Loading. Also with us today and our final member of our panelist, who is also from Concordia University, uh, Massimo Carboni. Uh, Massimo is uh, completing a master's degree uh, in mechanical engineering at Concordia University, focusing on composite manufacturing. Um, he is originally from Canada and has uh, been exposed to many different aviation companies where, where he's also uh, been able to intern and is uh, hoping to uh, stay involved with composites in uh, aerospace after completing his studies. The title of his work today is Nonlinear Behavior of Topreg Tensile Modulus for Automated Fiber Placement. So again, we've got seven, eight members uh, joining us today for this panel. And we've got lots of questions and an excellent variety of work to discuss. So without further ado, I think we will jump right into the questions. Genevieve, you happen to be at the top of my stack, so I'm gonna start with you. Um, in your work with ultrasonic consolidation of dry carbon fiber and PPS film, uh, with respect to ATL and AFP manufacturing, have you pursued any ultrasonic compaction uh, on the fly with either of these processes? And could you explain maybe a little bit more what that means? Yes, I uh, just like before I answer, um, specify that yeah, the bio that you read was for my PhD student uh, who couldn't <laughs> present and be here today. Um, so yeah, I'm an assistant professor at LSU in mechanical engineering. <laughs> okay. um, but that, yeah, that being said, um, with respect to ATL and AFP uh, manufacturing for the specific project and application, we haven't uh, pursued any ultrasonic compaction so on the fly with those uh, processes. This is one of the long-term uh, objectives for this project. In the shorter term, we're looking at using, uh, you know, robotic manipulators, for example, to start looking into um, the process in a continuous, uh, you know, fashion. Uh, but for AFP and ATL processes, I mean, it has been investigated in the past decades, I would say at different points, by different groups and uh, companies. So with some, uh, well, different levels of success. I had some examples in my uh, presentation when I talked about the state of the art. So usually people also start looking at smaller scale. So just a few, uh, well, I don't know, like, 30 centimeters to look at uh, the process, so layer by layer, similarly to AFP or uh, ATL. So what we uh, were looking at in our work, uh, we're trying to look at this method to bring a bit more flexibility. So in terms of combination for polymer and uh, reinforcement types, and then perhaps looking at applications uh, like localized reinforcement or for repair patches. Excellent. Um, could you could you comment maybe on your thoughts regarding the U.S. power frequency levels needed uh, as a function of fiber form, such as uh, unidirectional versus fabric, uh, and how that relates to the laminate thickness? Yes, that's a good question. So uh, typically maximum power available uh, for the welder is roughly inversely proportional to the frequency. Uh, so if we look at, well, typically in the field frequency uh, range that is available will vary between 15 kilohertz to 40 uh, kilohertz. So if you look at 30 and, kilo and 40 kilohertz, um, you will have 
lower power available. So it's a more compact equipment, uh, smaller tools like the horn or the sonotrode, uh, but you can't provide as much power as if you were using 20 kilohertz. So for example, with 20 kilohertz, uh, you can achieve higher amplitudes, higher uh, power. So um, it's suitable for most thermoplastic composites. Um, like such as the high temperature uh, thermoplastics that will require more energy to reach uh, glass transition or uh, melting temperature. So in terms of fiber type, I don't really have a clear answer to this question. This is, uh, I mean, something we're looking into. So I'd assume that uh, fi fabric uh, reinforcement type would require possibly more power because it's more, uh, well, difficult to impregnate. So between uh, the toes, so depending on the geometry, uh, but I'm not sure it would make a significant difference in terms of power requirements compared to UD uh, reinforcement. Uh, for the laminate thickness, well, I think, well, obviously if you have more layers, so if you consolidate more layers at a time, you will require uh, more power. For our experiments, uh, roughly, uh, we used at least 70% of the power. So uh, we had 3,000 watts for the welder that we used. So 70% of 3,000 watts was required to complete consolidation. So with uh, four layers of uh, thermoplastic film, three layers of uh, fabric. So we're, I mean, we're looking into uh, the number of layers in the layup. Uh, and how uh, we can still complete efficient compaction with uh, the power that we have available. So we're looking, uh, so how many layers we can, uh, I mean, consolidate at a time uh, instead of doing, you know, layer by layer approach, like, uh, well, similarly to AFP and uh, ATL. Okay, thank you. Scott, you're next. Scott's work again was on the, a holistic approach to composites quality using AI uh, for automatic inspection. Scott, is this technology able to detect voids or cavities uh, in the composites? That's a great question. And the answer is not yet, um, but with the holistic approach that I'm describing in the paper, what we're doing is adding and combining data generation um, sources in inspection to support uh, the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning classifiers. And as we have more and more data, that's um, what I call um, calibrated data, where we know the places that the data was collected and what was going on at the time, um, we can develop deep learning classifiers that can recognize um, various flaws uh, that come into existence. I mean, we started out with fiber orientation, material location, uh, we're working on lapse gaps. There's a lot of different kinds of things with FOD. And it's clear that with these big quality data models that we're just beginning to be able to collect, um, that using them with um, artificial intelligence and deep learning, that we can correlate what was going on with the machines and the material with where the um, uh, voids or DLAMs or, or things like that occurred. And that's an ideal application for uh, the artificial intelligence technology. And I'd like to point out that that um, the, the various technologies that are used with composites in aerospace break down into different categories. You've got design and modeling, then you've got manufacturing and you have quality. And there've been tremendous advances in design and mod modeling uh, in, um, with CAD. And that those advances haven't been accompanied by similar advances in quality inspection. We still have uh, the majority of the quality inspection being done by um, a tired, distracted, um, uh, biased person just going up and looking and saying that looks about right. And so 
by combining the profilometry data, other image data, we have a system that captures very high resolution uh, images of um, small areas on complex surfaces where each pixel can be related to a region on the model. Um, that by combining these, these different kinds of data, the data that comes off the AFP or ATL, and building classifiers, uh, we think there's a good possibility that we'll be able to predict and prevent um, all kinds of flaws, including voids and uh, delamination. And we've got a couple of programs going right now. We're just in the process of applying uh, for funding for a um, large scale, high volume arrow structure um, uh, effort that combines large uh, AFP and ATL machines with some, some great um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, uh, capabilities. One of our team members is specializing in making a, um, a non-coding interface to build deep learning classifiers. So you don't have to have a data scientist to be able to take the data that's coming from your manufacturing and do an analysis on it that would yield um, um, prediction and prevention of various flaws. All right. You covered a lot more than I think just the, can it detect voids? <laughs> that, was, that was good, that was good, good background. Um, the, the second question, unfortunately, that I was supplied with is, if it can detect voids, what's the smallest size as it can detect? But it kind of sounds like um, we're not really to void detection yet, but I did hear you mention uh, FOD detection um, or, or other uh, internal issues in the composite. Can you maybe talk about what size capabilities it currently can, can detect and maybe where, where you think you can get to in the future? Well, it, it depends on what kind of FOD it is that, um, that you're detecting. Um, with um, vision-based systems such as ours, you wanna be careful that things like tracers and uh, material labeling and splices and things like that don't trigger it. And we've had really good success with the um, training deep learning classifiers for all kinds of things, uh, things like loose native material FOD or hairballs or um, things like that. There's plastic, there are things that, that people drop into the, um, um, the product by accident. And um, so we generally run ours down to under a quarter of an inch square, you know, um, uh, we can see things the size of a baby aspirin if it's things like poly or a piece of a, a glove. And um, again, the capabilities that are going to come online by supplying large amounts of data to deep learning um, will advance the, the capabilities well beyond what we have now, which is mainly just having people looking and not seeing the FOD. Right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Caitlin, you're next. Hello. Caitlin, uh, really, really simple question to just kind of start start this off. Uh, in in one of your presentation images, uh, particularly number slide number six, uh, the question is: Can you identify the linear strain direction? Um, and maybe explain maybe explain a little bit more about uh, what what is going on here. Uh, for the people that don't have access to the, the image. Yeah, um, so my work is using digital image correlation to track the strain development um, through a pretty simple temperature cycle of unidirectional prepreg. Um, and I'm looking at the linear strain in direction two, which is the direction perpendicular to the fibers. Um, yeah, so that's that's about the direction we're looking at. Um, and DIC can give you, um, it gives you a, th a three dimensional um, view of, of the strains that are developed, but we found that um, the noise level is a little hard for us to see in direction one, in the direction of the fibers and um, in the through thickness direction, direction three. Okay. So that's what we're focused on two. The, the next, question was also very specific. It it's, uh, again relates to a couple of slides in particular. So maybe 
in a more general sense, can you just talk about um, what different orientations did you study? Uh, or in particular, uh, what were the orientations of the four plies and how were they laid up? Um, and how, how does the layup orientation impact um, some of the measurements that you've seen? Yeah, so what we were looking at was um, unidirectional layup. So uh, four plies, zero orientation um, in a stack. And uh, we've also looked at one ply level. Um, our samples were quite small, only one or four ply um, due to our experimental setup. Um, and we're able to see, uh, we wanted to start out with just kind of a basic understanding of, um, can we use DIC to visualize these strains? Um, and when we start really getting into what we were, um, what the results we're seeing, um, we decided not to explore too many different variations in uh, ply orientation because we wanted to dive into um, kind of the interesting uh, results we were seeing in the pregelation behavior. We weren't seeing um, necessarily a super linear um, response to uh, thermal strains. We were seeing um, drops due to the, the um, actual morphology of the ply. So that's kind of where our work ended up diving into as opposed to studying different orientations. All right, thank you. Dan, in your work, uh, Institute Consolidation of Complex Curvature Thermoplastic Composites, um, in one of your slides, um, it looked like the stresses are higher uh, with full scale and get smaller as the part size is reduced. Can you explain why uh, that, that happens? Dan, if you're talking, can you un unmute yourself? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I had an airplane flying over. Awesome, um, thank you. <laughs> so uh, on the screen here, you see the slide that they were questioning. Um, and basically, what, yeah, this is uh, based on some work that uh, was done at TPRC in the Netherlands uh, and the fellow named uh, Thies Donderwinkel, uh, who, who's really an expert in this field. Um, basically, at Collins Aerospace, we build nacelle structures that go around the engine. So we're looking at curved thermoplastic composite structures. We've been doing them in thermoset for years, um, and now looking to what what would it take to make these compound curvature thermoplastic structures um, in a cost-effective way. Obviously, if we build it the same way we build thermosets, it would be cost prohibitive. So we start off looking at all the different processes and, and setting the boundaries. Of course, this is the upper boundary limit of, of you know, if you had a stamp machine big enough to do something as large as, as um, an aerospace structure, um, you know, what would be, besides the, the tooling and the machine cost, what, what are the other limitations? And this is what this focuses on as we started with the full um, uh, hemisphere and, and what uh, the stresses would look like um, during the formation. And basically, um, we, we looked at a number of scenarios where we break it down to smaller and smaller pieces of this um, curved structure, uh, compound curved structure and see how the stresses change during a stamp forming operation to see if we could, you know, obviously build multiple pieces and then attach them all together. Uh, in this case, we get prohibitively high strains during the forming process. Um, and really, uh, it comes down to uh, two different you know, stresses that are happening. The tension stress comes from um, the traction of the material over the mold surface. And so the larger the mold surface, the more traction you get. So, so that's what results in, in excessive tensile strain. Um, and then the compressive uh, stress is caused by kind of the boundary conditions of, of the material around it. And so um, the more material you have around it, the more compressive stress you have. And by making it smaller and smaller, you shift that compressive to shear stress and reduce the compressive stress. So 
it, it, there's different stresses and different reasons why they increase as you go larger, but that's uh, basically um, what what Keith explained to me as, as as the differentiation between the two. All right, thanks thanks for the visual too with with your uh, presentation here. That that's very helpful. Um, another question actually pertains to slide fifteen. Um, can you explain the roller crush differences uh, between the concave and the convex tooling? Sure. Um, and and uh, this work here was uh, performed by uh, Coriolis in France and uh, Justin Marot, who's the, the co-author on this paper, is um, uh, a good reference for this. I can, I can kind of give a brief explanation, but uh, the more information would have to come from, from Coriolis. But basically, when you're going into a curved structure, or in our case, a compound curved structure, um, you have deformation. Uh, you, you need a soft roller because if you have a hard roller, you're only going to touch at one point and you won't be able to handle the curvature. Uh, if you want multiple fiber toes going down at the same time, in this case, we had eight fiber toes going down at a time, which is two inches wide. Um, and, and so you can't do that with a hard roller going on, on to uh, compound curvature. Um, you know, on a convex structure, you're going to be touching the, the top, uh, the middle of the, the, the um, roller will hit and, and then the edges won't have any pressure and, and then it'd be vice versa with a concave tool. Um, so the way we handle that is by going to a deformable roller and that allows us to give more uh, uniformity to the pressure distribution. Uh, obviously it limits now the maximum pressure we can apply, but it gives us the pressure distribution. And, and basically, um, you know, like I said, on a, on a convex, you're going to hit the, the middle of the roller first, and then it will continue to compress until you get all the pressure you want at the edges. And so you'll have a, a higher pressure in the middle and, and lesser pressure outside, but much more uniform than if you had a, a, a hard roller. Um, and, and, and then in reverse, when you're going into a concave section, you'll have more pressure on the outside and less on the inside. Um, and so basically the rule of thumb that they use is go with the softest roller you possibly can and still get all the pressure applied that you need. The, so the softer the roller, the more uniform the pressure will be. Um, so as long as you can attain your maximum pressure with that softer roller, that's, that's where you want to go with. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. All right, thank you. Simon and Chris. Uh, you guys want to bounce back and forth however you want to answer these questions, uh, please feel free to jump in. Uh, can you discuss some of the applications, uh, particularly within the automotive and sports and recreational areas for these, these materials and, and what, uh, how you think they could fit in? Of course. Um, yeah. So first of all, as Chris already said in our introduction, basically our main markets are the automotive industry and the aircraft interior industry. So basically, um, the whole idea for this project uh, came out of necessity. We are um, doing a lot of uh, projects with SMC, sheet molding compound materials, and sheet molding compound um, sandwiches as well. Uh, the problem is um, you need quite a high pressure and quite a high temperature for using, uh, for yeah, creating uh, 3D parts with this technology and uh, the problem is that uh, there aren't a lot of foams available at the market um, which can sustain um, this uh, thermal and mechanical requirements not not uh, the requirements of the application but the requirements of the process itself so they are getting not getting crushed so um, we decided to um, have a look at this uh, yeah it's, alternative uh, form, forming technologies and we discovered this forming technology um, for epoxies using carbamid salts, which isn't new. The approach is around since the 60s, I think. And uh, basically, uh, why is it interesting? It's interesting because it's an environmental friendly approach. We are just using CO2, basically, uh, to build up a complex with an amine curing agent. So we have a latent uh, foaming and curing agent in one material itself. So basically we are 
not using any physical or chemical hazardous materials as blowing agents. So for application for SMC sandwich technology, for example, sandwich panels in the automotive industry, or as foam core, for example, for the sports and leisure industry, where you need a low density, but very good thermal materials and uh, thermal and mechanical properties. And uh, you cannot um, have problems with humidity. Um, you need this kind of uh, foam um, that we developed. And um, basically it's uh, yeah, the other advantage why it, why it's environmentally friendly too is not only because of um, that we're using basically just CO2 instead of the hazardous uh, chemical blowing agents, but uh, also we have uh, this one pack formulation approach. So in the past, uh, when carbamates were used to form epoxies, um, the hardeners used had quite significant um, disadvantages uh, regarding the uh, foam properties or regarding the process control. So uh, we tried different uh, new amine hardeners, amine curing agents for this uh, blocking approach and we discovered uh, a few of them, mainly IPDA, um, which we are using right now, which is uh, very stable up to high temperatures. Uh, so you get a very, very low reactivity at low temperatures. So basically you can handle and store it up to one or two months in the one pack formulation, you don't need to mix uh, two uh, components together for the manufacturing. And this of course uh, can be interesting also for other customers uh, which are not um, yeah, basically mixing the material, but just want to use it for example, for free or for limited foaming. For example, as I said in uh, sandwich panels. And uh, yeah. I think there's, nearly nothing to add but concerning applications you can because the properties are quite nice and also good for fire resistance you have to think about battery cases for cars they don't fit in aluminium because aluminium doesn't fit the fire which can occur so smc and our foam will be excellent uh, you have to think about uh, sidewall panels and planes so it's also in the cabin so also they have to resist a certain flame retardancy and concerning leisure Okay, leisure mostly it has to be very cheap. So uh, up to now we haven't a leisure application. Uh, we had one uh, things about for um, submarines because also they did need a high uh, stiffness and high compressive stiffness in a deep of thousand meters. This could be application, but a submarine is not a leisure gadget. Sounds good. That's a good transition into the next question. Uh, just uh, could you talk a little bit more about the aerospace applications, particularly commercial aircraft and uh, any space uh, applications that might come from this? Of course. Um, so maybe uh, at Comprasec, we are our home market, let's say, is uh, aircraft uh, catering equipment and uh, cabin equipment as well. For example, this, uh, as you can see on our title um, sheet of our presentation, um, uh, for example, catering trolleys, which are uh, in the past were done with aluminium sandwich uh, and now are done mostly with composite and composite sandwiches as well. This, so this is one uh, uh, application because uh, these trolleys need some kind of thermal insulation and of course also bending stiffness of the panels. Um, other applications that we're looking in right now which are also not only interesting for our foam, but also in combination with the sandwich SMC approach would be in the seating area, for example, or the panel uh, for the head racks, etc. So we're trying, and this is actually one thing that is uh, still in progress. We're trying to optimize the flame retardant properties of our foam material. Basically, we reached some good results already but um, we are still trying to optimize and uh, uh, tune these properties more so we, are, so we can get in the uh, applications with a really high uh, requirements for flame retardant, for example, also in heat release, like the head racks, for example. Um, other applications which are not mm, 
yeah, which are not uh, connected really to flame retard would also be uh, secondary structure elements. For example, um, this form could not only be used, of course, with a sandwich SMC, but also in combination with pre-breaks, for example. So we're having a look at uh, this, this kind of applications right now uh, for, for, for the future development. But um, of course, there are some other requirements which are also, um, yeah, which can also be met by our form, for example, the high mechanical properties and high TG. Um, basically, we have a TG of our material of uh, around 150 degrees C, uh, but uh, we, it's not shown in the presentation, but uh, in, in the uh, framework of the project, we also developed epoxy foams um, with uh, tunable morphology and low density uh, with a TG up to 200 or 210 degrees C. So we have quite a wide bandwidth also for like structural, uh, yeah, structural panels as well. Regarding aerospace, so of course also could be interesting. Uh, up to now, we are, do not have an applications in the aerospace uh, sector besides uh, the aircraft interior parts that I already mentioned, but this can also be, yeah, this will, will also be possible, I think, after some uh, more development at our material system. Um, but secondary or primary structure, I think this takes decades, of course. Yeah. One has to be realistic. If, if you're lucky. <laughs> of course. All right. Thank you. Hossein, I think, has joined us. Um, Hossein, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Um, the first question I had for you was, can you just talk about some of the more surprising or interesting things you discovered along, along the way in, in your work? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think if I just want to mention that uh, the interesting or surprising part that even it made us surprised, uh, it can be categorized as manufacturing and resultant analysis. So from the manufacturing, uh, let me just, I think it's better to show that this photo that. So we are working on the effect of gaps on the mechanical performance with the focus on flexural response of the structure. So let me find that. Okay, so basically what we do is uh, investigating effect of toe gaps on the structure. What is really important to understand and we try to highlight it is matter induced uh, manufacturing defect is not necessarily equivalent to material defects because most of the time when we look at the literature, these defects or toe gaps, it is understand, understood as like material defects. But what we observe is Met, uh, manufacturing defect is equivalent to material defect and geometrical defects. So I think it's clear here that when we put a gap, the question is, we put a gap on a, or we, we don't put it, we have an induced gap from the manufacturing before the curing process. Now the question is what happens after the process? As Scott Keller mentioned that we had lots of advancement in the, manu in the CAD analysis and fine element analysis. Um, but the problem is we don't have a clear link between the manufacturing, between what, what we have from the manufacturing and what we simulate in the, in the fine element analysis. So what we observe here is when we have an induced gap in the structure that is induced that we cannot, uh, uh, we have it, we cannot avoid it. What happens during the curing process is the fiber moves. We have a fiber movement during the curing process. So now we have a thickness consolidation and material defects. That's interesting question. That, that's really interesting because that changed all of simulation, that changed all of our interpretation. And the other side is now the I think this job this study is one of the first studies on the out of plane behavior of the structure with defects, like flexural response. And, and also Intel laminar shear strength. So th I think this is one of one of the first uh, studies that deals with the damage, not just the fracture. So we saw many interesting results in terms of 
effect of these defects, both material discontinuity and geometrical discontinuity on the damage initiation and how it, how it reacts. And we are still working on this. And uh, these are two interesting subjects that I think we are working. And when it, it deals with out of cooling behavior or flexural response, that thickness reduction and thickness consolidation uh, plays an important role in, the, in, in this structure in our analysis. I think I address it. Okay. And I, I, I think you can see here that, uh, let me just, for example, if you see we have four layers of 45 laminates, we had a gap here, and you see that the change on the thickness during the fiber movement to the freer space of area, freer space that comes from the gap, that gap between the fiber toes. And this is one of the interesting things that we have to consider in our simulation, in our interpretation, in the damage analysis and fracture mechanics. Cool, I like the images. Thanks for sharing those. Thank you. Um, you indicate that uh, in the resin rich areas, um, the gaps can form. How do you think uh, potential delaminations would be affected in a more highly toughened uh, epoxy prepeg or maybe even a thermoplastic system? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we haven't done the test on the thermoplastic material, but I believe that would be more challenging because uh, as I mentioned here, so when we cure the thermoset material, we have a coal plate, we have a, a pressure of 90 PSI and we have a curing process of two hours under 180 degrees. So the fibers have time to move. The fiber have time to fill the gaps, as, but we have a consequence of thickness consolidation. But I, I believe when it, when it comes to the thermoset mater, thermoplastic material, uh, the material defect would be more dominant than thickness consolidation. And as we see, saw here and in our earlier investigation, these defects can be the source of delamination initiation. So I'm not sure, but I think that would be more challenging and that would have more effect on the material of top material or thermoplastic material because of the nature of the curing process, because there is no curing process. So that would be more challenging because fiber don't have time to fill the gaps. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Massimo, have you joined us? Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. Excellent, glad, you, glad you're here. Um, we've got a couple questions for you on, on your work. Again, just for reminding everybody, uh, nonlinear behavior of Topreg tensile modulus for AFP. Um, how did you choose 100 Newtons preload force? Uh, it's shown in slide 12 in your presentation. Um, and then in slide 15, uh, it indicates the prepreg toe failed at 200 Newtons. Uh, do you think their results uh, would have benefited from a lower preload? So the preload was necessary because in the uncured state, there was a lot of bending and twisting of uh, the tape. To come up with a 100 Newton preload, it was really true trial and error. So we did a bunch of test runs at different uh, preloads to see what resulted in the best result. And it was chosen to be 100 Newtons. I don't think that it really affected um, the results in terms of early failure or anything like that. And really, it just came through trial and error, the, the best thing. In literature, people did uh, the same thing with the preload. Their preload was close to their failure as well. Uh, failure was in splitting and of the fibers in the resin, so it was a visual thing that you could see when it started to happen. At 100 newtons, uh, wasn't observed, so we don't think that any splitting happened. Okay, excellent. Um, your model uh, produced modulus numbers that were consistently lower than the experimental values. Uh, do you think there could be a way to adjust for that with some sort of uh, factor uh, that could make the model uh, more widely applicable? Yeah, so for that, what I what we believed was best was actually to get a larger experimental sample size. So before adding any uh, like adjustment factors or anything like that, we wanted to see if we could test more samples experimentally and see if the 
the mean averages out and we get a lower standard deviation. And then afterwards, if an adjustment factor had to be done, it's a possibility. But uh, more than likely, we we're thinking that it's the experimental through more samples that uh, would have converged together. All right. Well, we've gone through everyone's uh, uh, questions that uh, directly related to some of the more technical aspects of your work. Um, we are running a little bit short on time, so I'd, I'd like to follow up with one question for, for, each, um, for each paper and just give you a chance to talk about where you're at and what the next phase of, of this, uh, this work entails. So we'll go back, back to the beginning and, and start again with Genevieve. Yes. Um, so the next steps mostly, well, one of the things we uh, found out that were surprising, uh, surprising dur during uh, this work, this project, is uh, the effect of the ultrasonic parameters on the crystal, uh, crystallinity um, of, well, the um, samples. So it seems like uh, pressure, at least based on the preliminary results, that pressure has an effect or amplitude may have an effect on strain-induced crystallinity. So that's something we definitely need uh, to look into and see how potentially we can uh, control the crystallinity of the samples based on the uh, ultrasonic welding uh, parameters. So the cooling rates are really high. So uh, with this process, so above 100 uh, degrees uh, Celsius um, per second. So uh, we have a competing effect between this high cooling rate and the ultrasonic uh, parameters potentially leading to strain-induced uh, crystallinity. So this is one of the next steps. And then we also want to look in more detail at uh, defects uh, after consolidation. So using uh, uh, microcomputed uh, tomography uh, techniques, then uh, looking as well as I said previously, the number of plies and the reinforcement types. And another thing that is challenging is to look at what happens during the process in situ. So we have designed um, optical welding frames, so with a high temperature quartz glass that allows us to see below uh, the sonotrode, so the flow visualization for the polymer, and uh, to take temperature measurements. So this will help us understand a little bit better how the process works with uh, different types of uh, reinforcements. Sounds good, thank you. Scott, what's the next steps? We're looking forward to running the first large scale integrated um, uh, manufacturing, uh, quality data collection and uh, artificial intelligence analysis, uh, either with a, um, a federal effort that we're applying for now, we're also wor working quite closely with NIAR, and um, we're going to be part of these three sets of resources that haven't been brought together um, in a coordinated way for um, a lot of development. Um, that's coming, coming around um, probably first quarter of next year, and I think we're going to see a lot of results related to flaw development and um, various to variations in um, uh, uh, manufacturing. All right. Caitlin? Yeah, so my work, um, we're interested in really taking this and um, putting a bunch of this experimental work into some of our simulation models that are done in our lab. Um, so that's one direction that we're, we're hoping to take this work, but there's also um, the connection between defects and um, some of these variations in the ply morphology that we're able to pick up using DIC that we'd really like to make that connection. So um, we're hoping to take that work in that direction as well. All right. And then graduation, right? Mm, I, I've actually already graduated, so. I'm Excellent. Just, there you go. Yeah. I can't even say that yet. I'm still working on it myself. So. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. 
Dan, what are you guys doing at Collins? What's, what's the next work with these thermoplastic composites? Um, so in this study, we were looking at uh, thermoplastic in situ fiber placement. That's, you know, fiber placement without going into any kind of post consolidation. Um, and, and really, the paper was kind of a, a challenge to the industry in general as to where we think uh, we need to go in order to get to a production version of in situ fiber placement. Um, and, and we think, you know, number one, it, it doesn't go fast enough for some of these large structures to be economically viable. It just takes, you have to go, go at such a slow speed with the fiber placement to build up the properties you need um, that it's just economically not viable. So that's a combination of process and material parameters. Um, there's a lot of good work happening on the material side, um, you know, Victrex's low melt peak, uh, which achieves a lot lower viscosity, has, has been shown to be able to get, a, get rid of a lot of the porosity that comes with just in situ only fiber placement. And, and that's been really good. But what they found was, okay, even though we get rid of the porosity, we still haven't got the properties up to equivalent to autoclave type properties. So um, I, I think in the paper that was published uh, last year in, at JEC, they, they found that the reptation time is not there, that the, they're not getting these intermingling of the polymer chains across the different uh, uh, fiber plies. And, and so as an industry, you know, those, those are kind of the big ones. There, there's other smaller issues in terms of Markov and, and uh, gaps and, and tolerances and release plies and that sort of thing um, that we also need to solve to get to that. So, you know, we're continuing to look for ways to reduce the cost of thermoplastic structures, thermoplastics already you know, certainly on a stamp forming basis compared to autoclave are going to save you, you know, at least 30% in cost and, and being able to achieve some of those cost savings on the larger fiber place structures is really the goal. So however that happens, you know, we, we we're limited by the physics of the material and the, and the you know, robotics available to us. So it's just a matter of um, how far can we go and, and what are the post processes that we need to do to achieve those things. So that's really what Collins is exploring, um, you know, the, NASA next composite program that they're trying to school up right now is looking at some of these problems with the, the in situ. So we're involved with that group trying to formulate plans to, to move forward and, and continue to bring down those costs and increase the, um, uh, the, the you know, the lower the cycle time of the process um, when dealing with thermoplastics. So uh, lots of work ahead. It's really fun. There always seems to be lots of work ahead in the composites industry. Chris and Simon, how about with your, your uh, foams? What's next? Yes, basically, um, as I already mentioned, um, the optimizing of the FST uh, performance is uh, one work package that we are already working on right now since we uh, published um, since we wrote this paper and uh, we're using synergy effects of different uh, flame retardants, uh, some active in the solid phase, some active in the gas phase in order to um, get a better FST performance uh, with a lower amount of flame retard materials and effectively uh, reducing the density of our foam furthermore. Because this is uh, one challenge that we are facing right now that uh, we do get uh, good densities uh, but when we want also the good FST properties, the combination is difficult. So we're working on that as a, a top priority um, topic right now. And uh, the other thing that we're working on right now is that for glass SMC, for example, for the SMC sandwich, <coughs> which needs lower uh, pressures for the um, for the production, we're quite happy with the mechanical and thermal performance, but. Uh, when you have uh, other applications, as I mentioned, or in uh, structural components or even in uh, carbon fiber uh, SMC, for example, which needs an even higher pressure uh, for the production of sandwich panels, um, there's still some room for optimizing. And one approach that we are uh, using for this is a pre curing approach, um, uh, as um, written in the paper uh, that we're using for the specific tailoring of the morphology of our form. And right now we are looking into combinations of different amine systems. So uh, using different amines for the pre-curing and for the hardening and forming as well. So this combination is quite 
promising uh, as it seems right now. And uh, last but not least, we are looking into the upscaling and production and process uh, development. So uh, we are already having a look at um, bigger scale production of our carbonate salt for, uh, for the uh, blowing and also um, uh, having a look at uh, producing bigger panels, uh, bigger sample sizes uh, with our foam. Sounds good. Chris, you want to add anything? Yeah, someone also mentioned it. We have got a project for a small or bigger scale production for small discs. It has nothing to do with automotive, nothing to do with aircraft. It's another industry. And we have another project to use this foam, how you call it, more in situ foaming, that uh, we want to add and press some pre prepack or some skin layers, I will say and then want to make the foaming process in the mold. So we have got an in-situ foaming process and so a cheaper production for foaming uh, pieces. Cool, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Look forward to reading about that one when it comes out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hossein? Yeah, so as I mentioned that the challenge we have we already have is linking between what we have in from the manufacturing and what we are going to simulate. And we are working on the, this challenge because uh, the induced gap or the defects have a random feature in both larger scale and micro scale. Uh, what I'm trying to say is the thing is the distribution of these gaps are random. We don't know. I think that's the answer that the Scott would be uh, are working on this, that how to get this uh, gap defects, how to uh, monitor this defect on the larger structure. And at the same time, uh, because of the forming of these defects during the curing, there is a random feature, fiber moves, we don't know yet. And we are working on a, a machine learning approach to um, like to simulate a micro or micro meso structure that is a promising micro meso structure that can simulate this this randomness feature. Uh, I think that's really challenging because we need more data. We and uh, when it comes to random process, we, we need we need more data, more experiment, more simulation. And it's never done. Uh, I think we have to work a lot. All right, Massimo. What's what's the next steps on on your uh, on your project? So since uh, publishing the paper for Sampi, a finite element model was done to investigate it further, along with uh, more math models. But I'm actually uh, finished my thesis now for graduation, so I don't think I'm going to be continuing it more. But I might go to another uh, research student to continue the work in that. Excellent! Congratulations on finishing. Thank you. All right, we've got one minute until one o'clock. So I'm gonna open it up for the, the final question here. Is there anyone on our panel that would like to ask another panelist a question about their work? No? All right. Well, that's okay, because we did use the full hour. So I, I appreciate everyone's very detailed responses and, and uh, joining us today to explain what uh, you guys have been working on. You know, I, know, I know it takes a lot of time to do the research that we do in the composites field. And so I appreciate that you guys were able to share with us, uh, not only in your presentations that you submitted to Sampi, but also today, um, Via, via this virtual uh, panel session, some more details about what you've been working on. Um, I also would like to mention just quickly that uh, the papers by Chris and Simon and also the paper by Scott uh, tied for second place as our outstanding technical paper winners. So congratulations to, to you for, for those outstanding papers and thank you for submitting them to Sampy. Uh, with that, I would like to close out today's panel session.
thank you all for participating again uh, to both our panelists and anyone that uh, joined us today to listen in. If you do have additional questions, uh, please feel free to fill out the form on the uh, track landing page uh, on the uh, Sampy North America website and Sampy will follow up with, with any questions that you submit. Uh, please make sure to check out the content that's being released next week uh, on aerospace applications, market applications, workforce development, and digital modeling. Uh, all are being uh, shown again as part of the Sampy virtual series. So thank you again for joining us today, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person at a Sampy conference, hopefully next year. <laughs>